Good morning, everybody at home. Welcome to our service online at Northside Community Church. We have entered the Christmas season, so it's only fitting that we start worship this morning with some Christmas carols. So please stand with us and sing at home as we worship our Savior.
God the angel see He came to tell the Father's love His goodness and His grace To show the brightness of His smile The glory of His face So glory in the highest And all Your children see his name shall be called side or whoever else is watching this, friends, family, strangers, all good. So uh, it's good to be here. We're starting into the Advent season. We are starting into Christmas. That's another way of saying that. And so um, we're going to do what all Christians have done for a long time, a couple millenniums. Around Christmas time, we meditate, we Uh, focus on and we hear and relive the story of Christmas and uh, this year it's uh, the story of Christmas in the time of Corona and and so uh, I want to kind of bridge some things that we've been through Uh, if you've been a part of our church or watching online or something we have been in the life of David for some months now uh, because there's a lot of stories of David and they're great stories 
And so the last time uh, we met, Pastor Ed preached a great sermon last week. Watch that if you haven't. And um, last time we met, we did a little bit of history, and we're going to do that this morning. We're going to start with some lists. Everybody loves lists, and everybody has lists, whether they're mental, on paper, on Outlook, or wherever you might keep them, your notes, on your phone, or however you keep track of lists, or you have the mental capacity to carry around the lists in your mind, everybody has lists. The Bible is full of lists, and they're not really to-do lists, they're mainly lists of people that lived in certain times and in certain ways. And so this morning, we're opening up by looking at um, the first uh, biographer that we have in the New Testament, Matthew, St. Matthew for some. And we'll be looking at the first chapter, uh, 1 through 17. I'm just going to read the opening and closing verses, and then we'll uh, insert all the lists of the names, and then we'll uh, address this uh, text for today. Matthew 1, 1 through 17. This is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah. This is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And then in verse, that's verse 1, verse 16. And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, and Mary was the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. Thus there are 14 generations in all from Abraham to David. 14 from David to the exile to Babylon, and 14 from the exile to the Messiah. Okay, so there we go. Uh, I skipped the, the, the names, but uh, we see Matthew. You know, Matthew the tax gatherer is very organized with his genealogy. Uh, I don't know uh, if your family does the genealogy, but I, I do think that um, you'd be hard-pressed for most people to go past maybe a third generation. You might try that today with your family. Just how far can you go back? What do you know? It, it seems to be as people get older, they want to more know more about their genealogies. And so we have a bunch of genealogies. And a lot of people go to St. George, Utah to do that because the Mormon church has done a lot of genealogy work and we all benefit through it. Um, and so, uh, you know, and why is that? Frankly, because people want to know, where did I come from? Why am I here? Who's my family? What's in my family? Different races, different things, different continents, all kinds of things. And so, um, you know, you, you look at these list of names in here, uh, beginning, of course, with Abraham, and then you go through, and there's most of them we don't know. But a number of them we know because they're kings, and so there's things written about them. But it ends here with David. And so I just want to say a couple things for Christians. uh, If we go back a couple weeks to David, and this is David here, and uh, his kings followed him, many kings. We know about 20, uh, 20, multiply that twice, the northern kingdom, 40 kings after him. And then the country was exiled. In other words, they were captured and taken away from their country, and for about 400 years, there was no king, and then the first century A.D., Jesus shows up. And so we call that Advent, and Christians have believed and still believe, and all Christians believe, whether you're Roman Catholic, Orthodox, some Protestant, Baptist, Lutheran, whatever you might be, we believe in two Advents, the first arrival of Jesus and that there's another arrival. And he's on a cross the first time, the next time he's with a crown. So there's two Advents we believe in. And this is where we live. We live between Advent 1 and Advent 2. Jesus has come. And so that's what we look at um, during this time of year. Most of us is what Jesus did. And, And Matthew is very interesting because he does this thing. He likes symmetry. He likes organization. I don't know how he reported the taxes to the Romans you know, uh, but I'm sure he was pretty organized, had names, amounts. Uh, he was a bean counter. You know, he was an accountant of sorts. And so it's interesting that he organizes that there's 14 generations between Abraham and David. There's 14 generations between the exile, David and the exile. And then there's 14 more, and then there's Jesus. And uh, certainly, some are left out, but Matthew likes to be organized. So what is the big deal? Why worry about this? Why is this in the Bible? Why are there so many lists? And I have to tell you, frequently, 
I don't know how many lists are in the Bible. They're in the Old Testament. They're in the New Testament. Often they're church members, and it's real random, but they're there. People's names are everywhere. And that's the way the Jews, and that's the way the Christians wrote history with God and people. Now, so what this does for us is it keeps us out of the sentimental thing, you know, where Christmas trees and food and constant Christmas music and smells and, you know, chestnuts ro roasting on an open fire. This kind of keeps you out of that sentimental view of Christmas. And it goes, what is the real meaning of Christ Christmas? And in this difficult time that we're in, it's probably much better to be more in touch with the reality of our situation, certainly, and uh, the reality of, of God in this situation and how do we find him. So we're going to do this by uh, doing three points this morning. Who he is in the meaning of history, that's who he is. Why he came to bring us home. Jesus came to bring us home. How did he bring us? Through shocking love. What did he do? What was so shocking about that? And so here we are. Uh, it this looks, again, like a dry list of names, but it's really not. Uh, and uh, Genesis, uh, genealogy is Genesis. It's the same word, derivative. You know, words build on other words. It's, it means the beginnings. What are the beginnings? And so if you want to understand the Bible... This is not a bad tool. That'll take you through the bulk of the Old Testament. This, this thick book that's intimidating and confusing really has a plot line that's running through the whole thing from Genesis to Malachi, and that's in all Christian books. Okay, there's a few others that our Catholic brethrens have, but, but that is all that this thing, it heads with one story through it all. And so what is the meaning of history? When you open the Bible, the key to, so Jesus, we say Jesus is the key to understanding all of the Bible. Uh, and, and the Bible is the key to understanding the world. And the big story that we're all living in, this one. Uh, there's names, kind of dry lists, but, but um, Jesus is the meaning behind all this. Like John, one of the other biographers, says Jesus is the logo, he's the... He's the meaning. He's the word meaning. He, he means, uh, brings meaning to everything. And Paul says, uh, you know, born uh, before Jesus was alive before. And, and, and so Paul and all the people in the New Testament writers all talk about Jesus' existence. And it's just not the same as those Old Testament characters. They're all struggle and, and have many problems. And Jesus lives a life that None of us could have lived. And so we say, Christians say, we really say this, that Jesus makes sense of everything. Everything. Every philosophy, every other religion, every other view, everything about science, everything about history, everything about psychology, that behind all of that is the meaning. And the meaning has a name, and his name is Jesus History itself makes sense because of Jesus. It's, uh, and it's not a hidden thing. Uh, Christians, by a general rule, don't make up secrets to hide things from people. We just spill the beans. We put our cards on the table, and we tell you this is public truth. It's like when Paul was before the king. He said, you know, king, that... This wasn't done in a corner. You know about Jesus, and other historians have written about him. So what is my genesis? I mean, it, it is curious how we all get curious about where we came from and why, and of course, why we're here and what story you're living out of. And Christians have a story that we understand what things mean, you know, how we put it together. Uh, one of the things I do as a pastor, and Pastor Ed does this as well, and really all pastors, if they're involved with their congregations, I know sometimes pastors can just be speakers, but if you're involved with your congregation, you're really helping, and as other Christians, helping each, each other see the meaning be the, behind the occurrences in their life and see God's hand in there. Uh, and so, you know, some Christians live um, very conscious of that, and others, once they go out the door, it doesn't really mean anything. It's just, you know, a dog-eat-dog -dog world out there, and 
I feel like that's small-minded. That's not the way Christians are to live. And then some people accuse Christianity of being on the wrong side of history, that they hear about the uh, Crusades or something, and they have these ideas, but they're, most of them, quite half-baked. And, and also that Christianity is just one truth among other truths, and they all can't be true, really. And what do you mean by truth in history? And, 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 and so you have a view that you're working with. So as you're sitting with your friends at Starbucks or you're talking with your relatives, you're working with a worldview the whole time that you're even not even consciously aware of. And so when someone tells you your problems and you say, hey, I think that could work out because of that, 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 you know, and there's some meaning, you are working out of a Christian worldview. You're saying that problems have a purpose. That's Christianity at work, even though you're not conscious, you're talking like a Christian. And I, I mean, if the, the world's a, you know, a big bang and atheistic, atheistic is not a, a dirty word, atheist is a, is a person, uh, the idea that there is no God, there is no God involved in this world. And, um, and it's, it's interesting because uh, in, in the public Sphere, and you're going to see this at, in magazines as you check out of Albertsons or Vons or Costco or where, wherever you go. You'll see these magazines that question Christianity, question God, question Jesus. But, you know, um, there's a particular view that Christians have and it, and it develops. And it's, and it's not the same as the East. And with all due respect, Eastern understanding is that this world is just a collective dream and there's not much meaning to it. That is the view. That's the world view that's carried forward. Um, and matter of fact, there's an atheist, guy, a guy named John Gray. You could Google him and read up on it, but uh, he kind of agrees with Matthew, that, but he, he's an atheist and so he believes that we're just animals and evolution and all of that. Um, uh, but he says anytime you talk about history having a point or your life having a point, you're borrowing that from Christianity. He's honest. He's an honest atheist. You're, you're, you're talking like a Christian, even though you don't say you're a Christian. Maybe you have that belief. And so um, for the atheist, that's Jesus. The baby Jesus is just a, a baby born, uh, you know, around the beginning of the common era or BC, uh, BC AD, a, a baby that's born in poverty. That's all Jesus is. But Matthew tells us, and the New Testament tells us, and then the whole Bible begins to tell us that Jesus is everything. He is the meaning, He is the history. And why did the shepherds come? Why did the Magi come? Why did these people come? Why is Herod so nervous about somebody who supposedly has royal blood that's going to take his crown away from him and Herod goes after this baby? Why? What is that? And that leads us to the second point. Why is everybody trying to figure out, you know, why is everybody looking for meaning? And maybe the search really is not just looking for meaning, but it's looking for God. And maybe God's looking for us, but Jesus came not only uh, to tell us about the meaning of history, but he came to bring us home. I don't know where home is for you. I've lived uh, most of my life now in California, but I grew up in a place in Colorado, but I was born in Phoenix. And, and it's interesting to me, I can go to any of those places in certain places and the smells and the views and the things I see, they all feel a little bit like home. I mean, geographically, they feel a little bit like home. And, um, you know, and then when I get around certain situations, I, I feel that home, certain people and personalities. There are people in this church and you, you, you probably know who you are that when I'm around you, I feel at home. And in verse 12, we see some interesting things uh, back in this list. So it should, you, you should be able to see this. Open your uh, app or open a Bible, but it says, after the exile. And the exile, in verse 12, after the exile to Babylon, real place, really in Iraq. ISIS really messed with it. I mean, it's a real place. Babylon, after Babylon was the exile. And so Israel was lost away from its hometown and it wanted, and Israel was always talking about going home, going back home, you know, 
Uh, somebody said it's, the, it's the, the dream that we have of going back to the garden, and it is interesting. We're always trying to create nice gardens. But this exile, so Israel is in exile, and they want to go home. They want to go back to their country, and, and it's, it's, it's to the west of them. They're in Babylon, and they want to come back to where Israel is today. They want to go back home. And um, Matthew, uh, uh, Matthew recognizes that, and so he uh, does this beautiful poetry from 14 generations, 14 generations. And so he, he, he brings us, and then he brings us to Jesus, though, and the ultimate rescue from exile. Jesus is here to, rec- to bring us home, to get us out of the exile of our lives. And we all have exiles. We all have parts of us we know aren't right, not really sure how to fix it, not really sure what to do about it, but we know something's missing, something's dislocated, something's out of whack, something's bent, something's bad, something smells, you know? I mean, that's just sometimes our lives. And, but we want to go home. We want to be home with ourselves and home with other people. We want to be relaxed in our own skin. We really want that. We're kind of looking for Eden, you know? And I, I always like the Steinbeck, the writer Steinbeck, when he talks about this valley right here, uh, about how these warm foothills, you know, they're just a place to, to lay down. They're like a beloved mother, you know, and, and, and many of you feel very comfortable. You're at home here in the San Joaquin Valley, the southern end, Bakersfield. And Jesus wants to, to, to bring us home, bring us to our true home. Uh, C.S. Lewis talks about it too. He says, you know, we have this nostalgia that's in, in us, always wanting to go back to something familiar that we had that just brought those perfect feelings. We all dream about those things when we were a kid and something was good and, and we just want to go back there. And so Israel was in this exile and they're always writing psalms about how long, oh Lord, how long do we have to wait for you to come and get us out of exile? And they you know, they pined, they wished, they wanted to go. And, and, and we too are doing that a little bit like, how long do we have to put up with this virus, this pandemic? How long do we have to put up with these precautions and wear these masks and be careful, especially in this surge right now? Nobody really wants to get it because you don't know what will happen to you if you do. But we're all waiting. And so what's the answer? What's the answer for this time, this trouble? Well, I would say it's Advent. It's Christmas. And I want to go to another saint of sorts, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. In his, he's in prison. Now, he was a Lutheran pastor. Some of you caught the devotional, uh, the thoughts of the week. It was, it was Luther, but Bonhoeffer is uh, around the, uh, of course, Second World War, and he's in Germany, and he sees the evil that's occurring and he protests he ends up in prison and so he's in prison and he can't do anything but sit there and so he prays and he writes and so we have letters from prison from him and he said waiting and he learned this terrible lesson he said in prison you're always you're always waiting for someone to open the door so you can see there's another world out there. And, and of course, Hitler was still in control at that time, but he starts meditating on Christmas. Christmas is about waiting. And, and, and he says this great thing in his letter. He said, God's in the manger. And then his life in prison started to make more sense because of Christmas. I don't know what would make your life make more sense. Meditating on Christmas connecting with God in the time of Christmas in spite of everything going on around us. Instead of letting everything just rule us and our moods and our feelings and our past and our unforgiveness and all this struggle we have, uh, meditating on Christmas and seeing what that does. I love the song that says God makes all things beautiful in his time. Not that things are beautiful. There are things that are as ugly as can be as awful as evil, but God makes beauty in the midst of that. The darkest moments, meditating on Christmas, we wait and we wait. 
And how do we know that God rescued us? I mean, what's, what's the answer? What is God's rescue look like? Because, you know, people are rescue teams. We have to rescue people out of the rivers. We have to rescue people out of car wrecks. There's all this rescuing going on. How do you know it's true? Because Jesus did a scandalous thing and brought us shocking love. Shocking love. I had a... This last week, I got a phone call. Man, got a phone call. And a friend of mine, a good man, um, very sick, very sick, hospitalized, wasn't sure what was going to happen. And um, it really hurt when I got that phone call. And why did it hurt me just to hear those words it hurt me because he was a guy that cared for me. He's a guy that we worked together, that we loved together, we lost together, and we were friends amidst this great work in the Lord. And so it hurts, you know? And that's what love does to us when people really love us. Sometimes we can only see it in our rear view mirrors, but nevertheless, you know, um, this shocking love and... Um, and so in this, in this list, we see all these people that are not great, and then we see Jesus, and we see what he does to love us. And um, Jesus himself was, um, because there was a rumor of a king coming, of course, Herod uh, wanted to... Uh, you know, wanted to destroy Jesus. He was trying to find, and there was a little bit of a genocide among babies, not the first, not the last. Uh, in our genealogies, I don't know about you, uh, yeah, I've got a mixed bag. I got some people that are maybe kind of important people, and then I got some people like, I don't want to tell you about them. I don't want to tell you about Cousin Eddie, you know. I mean, there's just these things that people hide, you know, the, the crown. A lot of people are watching the crown right now, and there's this one episode where, you know, the, the royal family there in England have some, a bunch of mental illness on one side of their family. And, and uh, you know, you wanted to hide that or not. And I don't know all the truth of, you know, trying to hide it. But certainly it was real in their family lines. And Matthew is wanting to present Jesus' credentials to the people so they would believe. Matthew wants them to know where Jesus comes from. And what's really interesting in this thing is the mothers. <laughs> this, this sermon really could have been the mothers of Jesus. I would have liked that, you know. And, uh, and so, because it's, it's kind of scandalous, you know. Uh, and, and that's how people in those days, if, if your name was on something in those days, you had some importance. I mean, lists and writing were so different. We're flooded with words and internet, and I, I, I mean, it seems like nothing means anything. But then, if you were on a piece of paper, you're a pretty important person. Just your name was on some, or papyrus, or whatever they wrote on, your name was on there. You're really important. And so, Matthew wants everybody to know who Jesus is, where he came from, son of David, Abraham, you know, how his credentials in the Jewish line is so on and so and in the list are these scandalous people that have you know no legal status there's a slave there's a gentile there's i mean these are jesus's mothers grandmothers i mean you got uh tamar she was an adulterer you got rahab she was a prostitute uh you got uriah's wife bathsheba one of the great political scandals of that century uh, you got Ruth, who's not even Jewish, and then you got Mary, mother of Jesus, teenage, unwed mother, pregnant out of wedlock. Every one of these mothers are scandalous moms, scandalous moms, but Matthew puts them in there. What a trip. Matthew puts them in there. These are, these are broken people, ragtag. They're not as we would say, royal blood with some perfection. But Jesus, 
I guess you could see wears them proudly. And so that's so scandalous right there. That's what people say when someone's really out of control. You're scandalous. And, and that's a scandalous list. But what's even more scandalous is Jesus himself. The cross. The cross is a scandal. There's even churches that don't like to talk about the cross, for goodness sake. But it is offensive. And that's part of the scandal. Is to appreciate the love and appreciate what God did in Christ. And without recognizing that, you really can't do it. Uh, the cross is offensive to us. And, and it, it's an offensive message because it confronts me. And then at the same time, the cross melts me. It, it melts my heart. It, it breaks my heart in a way that needs to be broken so it can pump blood right and, and love and do things that I cannot do. One of the big things of being a Christian or not being a Christian is this agape love that God puts in your life where you can love all kinds of people even though you're so dysfunctional, so many problems, so much scandal. Sinners we are, as Yoda would say. Sinners we are. Bonhoeffer said, we should shiver a little bit at Christmas because it says Jesus came to do what? What, does, what was Jesus' purpose-driven life? Jesus came to save people from their what? Sins. From being a sinner. And I like the Presbyterian minister, uh, Jack Miller, where he says, you know, cheer up. You're way worse than you know. I like that. That's so encouraging, you know, that's so encouraging. But um, our sins create barriers, and, and God came to break all the barriers down. Sin uh, creates all kinds of political barriers, all kinds of racial barriers. Sin is always separating and sorting and judging and all this stuff, and, and especially religious unbelief is so good at that, and, but not Jesus' belief, not Jesus' belief. Um, and, and so the scandalous message of the cross is just that Jesus was on it. Jesus paid the price for us. And, um, and it should offend you. Do you get offended when you go to a doctor and says, man, you've got, uh, you've got a thing in there that I've got to cut out of you. I've got to cut something out of you. Are you offended because the doctor says he's got to use a knife on you? No, you're thankful. Thank you, doctor. I don't want that thing in me, man. That thing's bad. Get it out. And that's how God is. God is the physician. He is the real doctor of our hearts and our lives. And he offends us. It cuts to the quick. I love in Acts when it says all these people, it says 3,000 came to faith. It says their hearts were cut to the quick. It cut their hearts when they heard about how Jesus died for them and loved them. It confronted them and loved them at the same time, and it broke their hearts, and they all became Christians. John Stott, famous English evangelist, wrote a classic book on the cross, and he said the cross was reserved for the worst of the worst. Did you know that a Roman citizen couldn't be crucified? It was illegal. No matter what they'd done, couldn't be crucified. It was only for slaves, foreigners, you know, everybody else, the scum of the world, and if you weren't Roman, you were scum. That's who got to be crucified, and that's what happened to Jesus. It took the church about 150 years to realize that the cross was important, and it began to be the symbol for Christianity. Um, and you know what Jesus did for on the cross? You know, there's nothing you can do, that you and I can do, to make God love us more. He already loved us completely and more, much more. And there's nothing bad you can do to make God love you le less. Now that's confusing. You can't do anything more to let make him love you more. and You can't do anything terrible to make him love you less. He just loves you. His will through the cross, on the cross, is his love for you is bestowed. It's a gift. It's a gift. Have you received that gift? Do you know Christ loves you? Have you said yes to that? Oh God. Yes, if there's a great time to be saved, as we would call it, to be Christmas time, it's a great time to do it. 
And, and, and you know, I mean, I, I love my kids. I love my sons. I love my daughter-in-law. I, I love them. And um, it doesn't mean, I, you know, I, I'm a proud, I can be proud of something, but no matter whether they've done good or bad, I still love them, and it's just right there. And, and how weak is my love compared to God's love for us? And, and when you think you have to perform your way and you have not received the grace of God in that way, in that offensive way, in that incredible way, we end up with grumpy Christians. And that doesn't help a thing. God loves you, and you can't make him love you anymore. God will forgive anybody, anybody who cares. And, 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 and we have the country that's been crying out for justice. Well, God too, and God made the center of all justice on the cross. All justice occurs on the cross. So really, this list is about Jesus' moms. I should have just said that, moms. Ruth, she's an outsider. She's Jesus' mom. Rahab, she's a prostitute. That's Jesus' mom. Bathsheba, hooked up with David. That's Jesus' mom. Tamar. An adulterer, that's Jesus' mom. Mary, unwed, pregnant teen, that's Jesus' mom. And you are not just you, but you're a child of the king. King Jesus, the one who is and is always forever. Let's pray today. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for this day. Thank you for what you did Christmas, what it really means, that it was so scandalous, Lord, so confrontive and so loving all in one. And so I pray for the person today that's struggling with their lives, that can't wait for Christ, that's just waiting for things, for resolves in their personal life with their children, their husband, their wife, their lack of their husband, their wife their jobs, whatever it might be, illness, Lord, whatever they're living in. Father, you are their king, and you are Lord of this world. And so, Father, help us to accept what already is, that you are Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, come.
here to share with you this mission that we're doing. Normally, we do Christmas shoeboxes through Samaritan's Purse on a global scale. Due to the coronavirus, we were not able to do that this year, but we were able to work with the mission of Kern County on 21st Street to do Christmas Eve shoeboxes. Each shoebox gives the gift of cheer and joy to someone in need. This year, you have several options. You have children's, boys and girls, and you have adults, men's and women. A shoe box or a plastic box looks like this. And inside, this is for a boy, ages five to nine. You have a football, gloves, candy, teddy bear, crayon, colored pencils, cars, anything you think a five to nine year old boy or the child of your choosing would like that can fit in the box. We also have a women's box, which has washcloths, shampoos, conditioners, socks, beanies, razors, anything that might help a woman in need. We have these available for pickup that show you what could be put in the boxes. These are simple things that you could pick up at the Dollar Tree. It doesn't have to be expensive or extravagant. It's the thought and the care that you put into it that really matters. We will be picking these, having you drop these off December 13th between 1 and 2 here at 3331 Callaway Drive at Northside Community Church. Or you can bring them any Sunday before then and drop them off at our Christmas tree. We are so looking forward to sharing the joy this Christmas season. And we really need help. And we need all the shoe boxes that we can get. And if you would want to wrap them, you wrap the box and the lid separately so they can go on together. So don't forget that these are going to be picked up December 13th at 1 p.m. here at Northside. Thank you guys so much and I look forward to spreading the cheer with you. Hey, we had a wonderful day at church together and I hope you enjoyed that sermon. I know it really uh, meant something to me and I pray that uh, God would really speak to your heart. Hey, I got a few announcements here. The first one is, is that uh, we are doing our Bible studies. We uh, would encourage you to come, bring your mask, make sure we have a hand sanitizer for you. We're social distancing, uh, but come uh, on Tuesday at 6.30 p.m. We have women's ministry and they're doing uh, a Bible study right now, discerning the voice of God. And uh, from what I've heard, it's been an awesome experience for the ladies. And the men, we are meeting at the same time, but downstairs in the cafe. And uh, we will be doing our Bible study also at 6.30. So men, come, be a part. Uh, and uh, also, uh, we have Celebrate Recovery on Thursday. Uh, Thursday at 6 p.m. If you're trying to deal with this holiday season and you feel that you really have a hurt habit or hang up that just is rising its head, I would encourage you to come. Be a part of Celebrate Recovery. And if you know somebody who's dealing with something, uh, a hurt, a habit, or a hang up, uh, and their life has become unmanageable because of it, then I would encourage you to uh, bring them or, or just send them on a Thursday at 6 p.m. for Celebrate Recovery. And uh, it's been a, a great morning and I'm very excited for what the Lord's going to do here at Northside and I would like to end this time together with a word of prayer so if you would pray with me dear Heavenly Father Lord God we just thank you so much for all that you've given us Lord you are truly the giver of peace the giver of all provisions and Lord you're the healer of all physicians so I pray now Lord that you would bless us as we can bless those around us our neighbors lord help us to love our neighbors as we love ourselves and so father help us to be your light as we go our ways this week keep us safe protect us from this sickness this covid virus but be with us that we can still assemble as a church we thank you so much lord in jesus name we pray hey lord bless you and we'll see you guys soon